All right, so now I'd like to introduce you to the president of WSBR, Ms. Sally Richardson. Hi, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to, uh, to welcome you to the third of our series, uh, full series. Sally, your audio is not Oh, there you are. <laughs> can you see me? Sorry. Your audio cut out, but we can hear you now. Okay. Um, so we have a fireside chat with Ruth Pritchard Kelly, who's the Vice President of, Reg of Regulatory Affairs at OneWeb. And uh, she will be um, meeting with Brian Weimer, uh, who you'll be introduced to in uh, shortly. But first, I want to just put in a few words for Washington State Business Roundtable. Our charter is to uh, provide uh, support to local businesses in the Washington, D.C. area, but more importantly, to provide education resources to uh, children in the uh, capital, national capital area. We have an all-volunteer board uh, who work tirelessly to bring programs such as the one today that you'll be seeing. Uh, and every, all the proceeds for this event uh, will go towards that, that uh, very important char education charter that we have. Uh, we have another exciting program for you coming up on December 16th. It will mark the uh, one-year anniversary of the inauguration of Space Force. And we will have General Bill LaCoury, uh, who will be uh, speaking with us on the 16th. So finally, it's my great pleasure to introduce Aaron Lewis, who is today's sponsor from Ariane Space. Uh, Aaron is VP uh, of the U.S. subsidiary of Ariane Space. Ariane Space is a Paris-based uh, company, the world's first commercial launch company that sent over 600 satellites into orbit, and they are all launched out of French Guiana, out of Peru in French Guiana. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Aaron, who will be introducing Brian. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for that introduction, Sally, and uh, welcome everybody to this WSBR fireside chat. As you can see, there's actually one real fireside in operation, and then uh, you decide whether or not the one uh, that you see behind Brian Weimer is actually virtual or or genuine. Um, but I can say uh, our in space is genuinely proud to be uh, the sponsor of today's event. We're very, very close to our uh, customer, our biggest customer at this point, uh, OneWeb. And uh, we've been associated with OneWeb since it was uh, a concept and uh, we're really, really, really excited and very proud to have a role in bringing this connectivity constellation into operation. We've already launched three times for OneWeb, uh, placing nearly uh, 70 satellites into orbit. Um, just this year, we had a launch uh, in February and in March. And then a year ago in 2019, we launched out of French Guiana. We've got uh, 16 more launches to go. For OneWeb, the next one will be out of the uh, uh, Cosmodrome in Vistachny in far eastern Russia uh, later this year. So as we ramp up for that, um, we get more excited to see uh, OneWeb put into, into uh, operation. Uh, but my uh, more immediate job is to introduce my good friend, uh, Brian Weimer. Brian, uh, an attorney by trade, is a partner at Shepard Mullen here in town. Um, he's best known for his chops in the satellite industry. Um, many of us here have uh, known Brian to have had a hand in some of the most important uh, deals and transactions and operations in the satellite industry. Um, if you need uh, any help with uh, the FCC or anything else associated with satellite telecommunications or SATCOM, Brian is your guy. Um, it's probably known uh, how big of a Nats fan Brian is. Uh, there's a rumor that he was first to line up for the Nats parade last year when they won the World Series. Uh, less known is the fact that he did spend one year at my alma mater, St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland, before he shipped off to University of Chicago to finish his academic training there. Um, so you can talk to Brian about telecom. You can also talk to him about telecom at the time of Pericles in ancient Greece, and uh, he can handle those kinds of questions. But with that, I will uh, hand the baton off to you, Brian. Um, and I'm really looking forward to your chat with with uh, Ruth about OneWeb today. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Aaron. I really appreciate that. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Ruth Richard Kelly, uh, the featured guest today. She's a seasoned veteran of, these, of this uh, great industry, and she's reached the highest echelons of, of what we do. And I think it's uh, terrific that she's agreed to speak with us today. By way of background, I'm an attorney, as, um, as Aaron was saying. So I'm a partner at Shepard Mullen. I lead the telecom team there. One of our clients. Um, one of is the brainchild, of course, of Greg Weiler originally, and I also worked with Greg on O3B. Um, but I want to talk about Ruth, um, and I, I look at your background, and it's really fascinating because um, I see that you, you studied theater at the University of Maryland. Um, how did a theater major become a satellite lawyer? Um, I don't think anybody dreams of being a satellite lawyer. It's like one of those careers where you don't say at your elementary school, I, I'm going to grow up and be a, a satellite lawyer. Um, but uh, if you want to be an actress, you have to make money. And like many, many people, I turned to my daddy and asked him for a job uh, doing anything, pushing brooms, filing papers. And he said, sure. And he happened to be a satellite engineer. And there was a huge international fight between the French and the Germans over the direct broadcast of television. I can't even remember from, from one country into the other. And, and it was so much more interesting than acting. It really was. And I went back and first I went to George Washington's what's now the Space Policy Institute and got a master's in, in space policy. Um, and then um, I actually got deep in the weeds of a legal issue at my first company, American Mobile Satellite. Uh, that's now sort of ended up as uh, Legato and also XM Radio, um, and realized that really, really what I wanted to be was the lawyer. Um, and I went back to school a second time um, in my 30s and got a law degree. Um, and it's been such a great fit, um, and it's, um, it's so interesting, the international advocacy that we do in the satellite industry. Right. So, and you know, we have this super cozy industry, right? Like it's quite possible it could have bumped into Aaron Lewis in the halls of St. John's. It's quite right. possible because my wife actually went to the University of Maryland Law School where you went at just about the same time it's possible that we could have crossed paths. This is an amazing industry because you bump into people along the way and we all sort of know each other and it's, it's very, very cozy. Do you have any advice? Because I've already had some questions from folks in, in the audience. Any advice for people getting started in the industry who might be wanting to get to the place where you've made it to today? What, what do you recommend? Um, well, the first thing is to make sure that you um, aren't stuck on, on envisioning one path. Um, there was literally no way I could have predicted I would be doing this when I was uh, in my 20s. So be open to a new opportunity um, and and internships. I really am a big believer, uh, first at O3B and, and at OneWeb, um, I like to hire interns because I feel like if, if we at the interesting companies don't bring in fresh people into the industry, um, then it won't grow. And you're right, we do, we know each other, which is exciting. Aaron, I'm already thinking of asking whether you knew people that I knew that went to St. John's, but just just this weekend, my landscaper said, oh, space law. I worked for Laura Montgomery in Bethesda. Do you know Laura? And I, yes. Of course I know Laura Montgomery, another space lawyer in Washington, D.C. In fact, globally, right? It's a, it's a small community. Um, it's an exciting community. And uh, I will note, I don't know many people who've left satellite to go into another form of te telecom. Right. It's, a, it's a great field. And, and looking over your bio, I also noticed it looks like, at least unless you haven't listed everything, it looks like you've really primarily had three jobs. Is that right? Swidler and then and then SES and then OneWeb. Is that right? Because that's kind of unusual. A lot of folks have, have had many, many jobs. Is it true? Uh, so what you're missing there are the roughly 15 years when I was home with children. Okay. So I got the law degree. Um, and during law school, I was also having a couple of babies. So I worked part time at all kinds of interesting things. I taught um, Internet law. I taught legal writing. I taught for the bar exam. But I also was a substitute teacher in Montgomery County Public Schools. I wow. did whatever I could right part time 
so that I was there at 3.15 when the kids got home. And my first job at Swidler, I want to give a real shout out um, uh, to Catherine Wong and, and Andy Lippman. They gave me a part-time job. So I was still home at 3 o'clock. And, and 20 years ago, that was really hard for a law firm. I right. wanted to work at the FCC. The FCC couldn't figure out how to give me part-time work. So um, it's been a very indirect route. And um, that's why I say, hey, be open. And it was um, unexpected that, that someone came to me, sort of, you know, someone I had known when I worked at AMSC to say, um, my company, SES, is investing in this new satellite company, O3B, and they, they need people to do license work. Would you be interested? And I said, sure. And then she said, and then she said, uh, the job is in The Hague. And I'm like, yes, The Hague. And I pulled out, you know, the atlas. I had heard of The Hague. I did not know where it was. I indeed picked up and moved to The Hague for a year. That's um, great. It was amazing. So was that, that was SES where that happened? That was SES, which had invested in O3B, and they needed right. people specifically to do O3B's licensing. And, and SES's own regulatory team wasn't big enough. Um, and, uh, and for whatever reason, they wanted, they wanted this position uh, in The Hague. So I was there for, for a year. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about that for a second, because I think those of us who are in the industry, and I'm assuming our audience is mostly in the industry, but just to remind everybody, O3B, so I met Greg Weiler in roughly 2006 or 2007 when O3B was an idea of his, and he came yeah. to me for some advice on ITU, FCC, sort of regulatory issues for the satellite industry. O3B stands for other three billion. Yeah. Greg Weiler's concept was that you could have a Neo constellation to bridge the yeah. digital divide. It's still, I think, the mission of OneWeb to do that. Um, O3B was, was Greg's first iteration, and I was so impressed at that time that Greg, who's a brilliant, incredibly energetic, and has a, a real ability to get people to, um, to invest in his ideas, had yeah. uh, already lined up uh, Google, HSBC, Liberty Media, SES, major players. So what was your role in dealing with O3B at, when you're, during your time at SES? Yeah, so, so, um, Greg had an amazing idea, um, but he came from the um, cellular mobile radio side of the telecom industry. He didn't really know how satellites were licensed, um, how an earth station was licensed, how you got um, the specific kinds of authorizations you needed for for the satellite system. And so that's what I did. Um, and it's uh, pretty much the exact same thing I came over to OneWeb to do. Um, and um, working with Greg is, has been an incredible experience, and, and also all of the people. Of course, Greg is the idea guy, um, not, not, not running either of the companies. Um, and they both are coming to fruition, which is um, just amazing um, to think that he had these ideas and, and, um, and, and two noticeably different architectures, you know, different technology, uh, medium Earth orbit. Um, doesn't work quite the same way, the low Earth orbit. Um, and yet I think, you know, O3B has been uh, very successful for SES. Right. So let's then fast forward now. Look, 2020 has been a heck of a year, a very difficult year for everybody. When I think back to just over a year ago, if, if I could take back my virtual um, screen behind me, you'd see that I have a Nats um, yes. like World Series championship flag on my wall. <clears throat> and I know you and I have attended some games together, and you are a huge Nats fan as well. 2019, the world was a very different place. 2020 has been tough. And COVID, I think, has been tough for everybody. Um, and I know OneWeb has gone through a bankruptcy process and is now really set to emerge. So can you give us an update on where things stand now? I know there's been a lot of public information generally, but what, what's, what's happening these days at, at OneWeb? Yeah, so um, it, it was not a coincidence uh, that we filed for bankruptcy um, basically at the same time that the world shut down um, in March from, from the pandemic. Um, our original largest shareholders um, took a brutal beating in the collapse of the stock market that happened uh, in early March, um, and they pulled back. They pulled back to their, their most essential business, um, which was not – one web. <laughs> um, uh, and yet, um, I think everybody knows that in July, um, the, the leading bid 
um, to, to resuscitate OneWeb came from uh, a company uh, temporarily called Bidco, one of those sexy names that, that bidders choose. Um, only a lawyer could think that up. Uh, only a lawyer could think that was sexy. <laughs> and that was a 50-50 venture between Barty Global. So Barty runs Airtel. It is probably, I believe, the either the second or third largest um, cellular mobile operator in the world. Um, and with funding from uh, Her Majesty's Government of the United Kingdom. So um, this new um, ownership um, is poised to take over any day now, literally any day now. I, I was so hoping that I would be able to make announcements today, but, but paperwork, what can I say, lawyers? It's just dragging on a couple days more than expected, but really, uh, almost every T has been crossed and every I has been dotted. Um, and any day now, there'll be a final announcement. Um, and yet it, it hasn't stopped the company. The amazing thing to me, and the amazing thing, by the way, to both the prospective and now the actual investors all along, one would continue to get licenses um, and make applications and get landing rights and make satellites. Our factory managed to send safely, you know, one person went in and did her job on the satellite and then left and a new person came in and did his job on the satellite. We continued to build satellites so that we are ready uh, to start our launches again in December. Um, and, uh, and Aaron, not to, to, to correct you, but I'm going to correct you. You guys have launched 74 satellites, 74 satellites, every single one of them fully operational. Um, and so we will start those launches. They're roughly uh, 36 satellites at a time. Um, in and the next December, one's in December? In the next one is December out of Vostoshny, the eastern cosmodrome uh, uh, in Siberia, Russia. We have not launched from there before, but, uh, of course, Ariane has. And, and um, I, believe, I believe the satellites just landed there today. So um, a lot of excitement at OneWeb, um, just just. Super pleased uh, to be getting back up to speed. So the the joint venture with Airbus, then the, the manufacturing of the satellites is still going forward, and that's fully operational down in Florida. I know the facility was all built and everything, right? It's still churning out satellites. You're saying it is, <clears throat> and, and you know, for the first uh, uh, the first few months of of this fall, um, once it became clear that we were reviving, um, it was it's slow going because um, not only do you have to be very safe at the factory because of COVID-19, but down the supply chain as well, right? So um, instead of, we, we were so proud of being able to build um, three satellites a day, you know, 24-7 um, if we wanted to. Um, and the factory is, in fact, designed for that full-time, 24-hour-a-day uh, production. However, it slowed way down, right, so, so that we were incredibly safe and careful um, in the production and again, down the supply chain. So each one of our suppliers also had to be safe and careful. Um, and it, 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 they are also all getting back up to speed as we all learn more about how to be safe around the pandemic. Um, and, and so we're, we're picking back up to a satellite a day. Um, and, and by 21, we'll be, we'll be in that monthly cadence. That's great. So, and just a, a side note, um, folks, when you're chatting, I do see those in real time, and so I will be able to monitor them and ask some of those questions throughout. So, um, one of the questions that's just come in from Courtney Stad is, what, you know, how is the business model changing to the extent you can discuss it, um, you know, yeah. for one web? Because there's obviously it's it's challenging with a change in ownership. So, um, I guess more broadly, let's just talk about one web and sort of the 5G and broadband opportunity? Because obviously one was what was created to bridge the digital divide, right? But there's many right. ways to do that. So can you talk about that at all in terms of a business model? Yeah, so I, I, I can. So let me back up all the way to Greg Weiler and the difference between O3B and OneWeb, right? So O3B is equatorial um, at, a, at a medium Earth orbit, and it was, it was a really good balance between how many satellites do you have to pay for and build and, and how much of the globe can you provide coverage to? So they, they, but by being equatorial, they got the meat of the population, right? Um, they got most of the world's population, but a big gap um, uh, were the poles. Um, they could not cover above about 45 degrees. Um, 
And so one of the differences with OneWeb was, first of all, we've gone polar so that there's full global coverage. There's as much coverage in Finland as there is in France, right? Um, and, and the other thing was to bring them much closer. And the distinction there is that while O3B can do most of the 4G applications you want, it can't quite do them all. So OneWeb can absolutely do all of 4G and probably everything everybody really wants from 5G. We're not going to do the ultra, you know, under 10 millisecond round trip um, financial applications. That's not going to happen. But, 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 but those aren't going to be in great demand in in the remote and 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 disconnected parts of the world anyway, right? So the idea here is that overnight, anywhere in the world, we'll have the same the same capability as you would have in a dense population area like New York City, right? So you're going to have your 4G wherever. And that includes in planes and on ships. So because we're polar and because we start launching um, and sort of what they say is populating, right, for people who aren't engineers, think of lines of longitude on a globe. That's exactly what our orbits look like, and we've got 12 of them um, that cover the globe. And so because we will start populating um, – well, the Arctic gets the earliest coverage. If you can picture that, those satellites all converging at the at the Arctic and the Antarctic, that's where the greatest coverage will be. And so that continues to be, in our business plan, the first goal, right? Arctic coverage by the end of 21. Everything above 50 degrees will have full 24-7 coverage. And we are talking to all uh, of the Arctic nations um, about what we can offer them in the, in the forms of alpha and beta trials and demos and tests. There are a lot of indigenous and local populations um, in, in all of the countries that for the most part have had terrible connectivity. Um, and as we all know, um, if you build it, they will come. Once anybody realizes what they can get from the internet as far as education and access to information and health and government services and entertainment and connection to other friends and family. Everybody wants it, right? I think so, the greatest thing, if I could just say, the greatest yeah. thing that happened to, to OneWeb in a way was the pandemic because it proved the business case. When the rich people fled Wall Street and went to the middle of the Adirondacks and didn't have good connectivity, they realized how important it is to have 4G everywhere in the world. Being remote should not mean being disconnected, unless you want to. You want to turn your phone off, that's different. Um, so um, that's excellent. And so I get the, the polar coverage. That's probably most, you know, there'll be some indigenous, indigenous folks there. The, um, probably the airline industry would, would uh, welcome that opportunity uh, and service and coverage. Um, but let's talk about the United States. I know Alaska has been one focus, yeah. um, and, there, you know, there's been a huge push in the United States to bridge the digital divide um, here in the United States. So here in the United States, what's the focus? Is it, I mean, obviously you can have service everywhere, but there must be some angle where you're going to bridge the digital divide in the United States, correct? Sure. So Alaska is one of the first services because it's up there uh, in the Arctic and above 50 degrees. However, the rest of the United States – our business model will be the same in the U.S. as it is in other countries. We are going to be the backbone that the local operators use to finally provide universal service, right? Every nation in the world, especially those with a fairly large geography, has an obligation that they've imposed on their telcos and their mobile network operators to provide universal access, universal service, lifeline. You've got to cover everybody, every farmer, everybody everywhere should have the capability of connecting. Um, and that's just not the case now, right? And so our goal, once we're up there, we've got that capability. And we will invite those, those rural telcos and those large international uh, mobile network operators, whoever, um, to use us as their cellular backhaul, as their last mile, as the way they connect. Um, and and um, we are committed to, to the, the entire United States as the entire globe um, as, a, as a way to connect everybody. Right. So in the United States, obviously, um, we were fortunate enough to work with you to get market access for OneWeb here in the United States, and that's excellent. 
Um, we have a question from the audience about Russia, China, and India. I don't know. I guess you don't. You deal with the FCC, but you also deal with a lot of other jurisdictions, and yeah. you must have to think about market access in the most important markets. What can you tell us about other markets that are target markets where you do have market access? It's a global constellation. So if you can envision that, we cover every country, um, whether they're a current political friend or not, right? And that's always a diplomatic situation. Um, for for any global company, um, and it will, won't be any different for OneWeb, right? So obviously I'm an American, and we've just had uh, the United Kingdom invest, um, and a an large Indian company invest. Um, you may remember that uh, the nation of Rwanda has been an investor from the very beginning, um, and so um, this colors who you. Uh, uh, who you're sort of allowed to talk to, but it doesn't change who you're capable. So it's there, the capability is there, the constellation is there. Um, we would love to see ourselves uh, as a neutral uh, provider uh, of services to the world, if it can be worked out politically. Um, and, you know, that remains to be seen. Right, so this touches upon another issue, and it's actually related to a question that's just come in, but let's talk for a minute about the IT, and then I'll dovetail to the other question that's just come in. So, you know, for those of us who do satellite, I mean, you, you have to deal with the ITU from time to time, right? And, and during the course of your career, I'm sure you've seen it change. The role of the ITU under different administrations in the United States, the United States takes exceptions to certain aspects of ITU procedures. How do you view this? Because I know you spend a lot of time in the UK, right, because you are a UK licensed entity ultimately. Is there a different view in the UK? How do you view the role of the ITU, generally speaking, for our industry? So the ITU is, um, and, and um, let me start by saying that I think that the ITU system of sharing spectrum is probably um, one of the best examples of a self-policing regime I've ever seen, right? And and so that means that um, if you don't abide by the spectrum rules and you just start using whatever you like, you yourself suffer interference, not just the other people, right? And so um, there's no incentive uh, to to ignore the rules. Um, However, the ITU was, was set up and the outer space treaties were set up in a, in a time when it was almost inconceivable that even every country in the world would put up a satellite, let alone the situation we have now, right? So I, I call this space 3.0. So if 1.0 was um, the major countries of the world launched satellites, 2.0 came along pretty quickly in the 70s and 80s when, when companies got involved. Right, so SES um, and Inmarsat, Intelsat, AT and T in the in the old days, Western Union and Fuse, they all put up their own satellites, um, and that's still happening. I think just recently in Indonesia, a large banking interest announced that it was going to set up its own satellite um, system, and then 3.0 is individuals. So now we have two or three very well known household names, individual billionaires who have enough money and the interest to put up their own satellites. And how does the ITU deal with that? Because the membership in the ITU are those nation states back from version 1.0. Um, and it chafes and it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not comfortable always, right? And so um, the nations um, have their delegations that go to the ITU meetings and every private company tries to get on the delegation because they want to influence um, how that nation votes or maybe even talk to other nations and influence how they vote. Um, and then when individuals go um, and, and knock on the door of the Secretary General of the ITU and say, what do you mean it isn't just a first person into outer space gets to do whatever he wants? What? Um, so it, it's, um, it's struggling to keep up with the time, um, and yet I still think it's the best system there is. I really do. So, and this, again, it dovetails with a question that's come in from Eugene Robin, which is, the question is, how is Starlink's posture, Starlink is SpaceX, posture on spectrum access affecting um, constellations like OneWeb? And that, let me just state for the audience, the, I think what the question is more generally, which is ITU has a priority regime. OneWeb has priority through its UK filings and other filings in the KU band. SpaceX is not 
doesn't have the same priority. They're behind OneWeb. In the ordinary ITU regime, OneWeb has the right to launch satellites, and the second person in line, second person priority, has to protect, generally speaking, the first one. Right? That's the way it works at the ITU. Yeah. In the United States, the U U.S. has essentially um, taken an exemption from that, and they say the companies in a processing round, and SpaceX and OneWeb and and other folks are all in a processing round for the KU event, have basically co-equal rights when it comes to access to the spectrum. The companies are required to coordinate under the traditional IT regime, but if they cannot reach a coordination agreement, then the companies, in the event of an inline interference event, which is when an Earth station is pointing to a satellite and you're basically going to cause interference to each other, then you have to split the spectrum. And so I think I know we saw recently, for example, that SpaceX is introducing this idea in other countries, which Again, this is kind of the conflict between what do you do with, uh, you know, an admittedly, you know, impressive entrepreneur like Elon Musk at SpaceX taking that policy, which is really an exemption from the ITU traditional regime and, and bringing it around the world. How's that, how does OneWeb handle something like that? Um, so, first of all, I want to remind everybody that, that although every nation is sovereign and may take exemptions from the ITU, the danger, of course, is that a country you don't agree with does the same thing. So every time the United States says, Nick, we're going to go our own way, uh, we're going to make up our own rule for using that band, it gives um, countries with which the United States is not currently friendly, let us say China, for example, it gives them permission to do the same thing. It is a slippery slope. When the United States does something like that, and they they always couch it by saying, "Oh, but this is just within the United States. This is just 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 you know in our nation where we are uh, um, entitled to uh, handle our spectrum the way we think is is best for our country." Indeed, you are United States, and indeed so is every other nation in the world. And once you stop harmonizing your use of the spectrum, it's chaos, and you've got the Tower of Babel, right? So it's super important for those technologies that span more than one country, for example, satellites, to have harmonized spectrum use. If every nation in the world wants to go its own way, it is chaos, right? So um, we have always been deeply disappointed um, in the United States for maintaining um, that position. They had their reasons. We don't need to rehash them. Um, I think they should, um, I think they should change. Okay. So, in other words, bottom line, do you think the IT regime works better and that we should all be following that as much as possible? And yeah. the more we take the exemptions, it puts at risk the global regime that we have that sort of has been working historically. Yeah, and, and one of the problems with the with the U.S. band sharing, um, and, and again, it's just in the United States. That's not outside of the United States. The other 199 countries of the world priority, which means SpaceX is absolutely entitled to launch their system, but if there's going to be interference, they are the ones who have to adjust their system so they don't cause interference into, into both our, our users. Um, in the United States, the U.S. just says, oh, if you can't figure it out, don't worry, we'll just cut the baby in half. And SpaceX, since they're the ones who would have the burden of protecting OneWeb, obviously they find it just easier to cut the baby in half. They are disincentivized from coordinating with us and the rest of the world because of this United States position. Um, and it's, um, it's deeply unfortunate, and I think it's a, um, a terrible precedent, not only for this specific issue, but for the United States in diplomatic endeavors at large. Thank you for that. Another question from the audience, and this is a topic that you and I were going to talk about anyway. Um, so the, the industry, you know, started small, right? I mean, it, it's very expensive to launch satellites in space, and now we're seeing more and more launch capabilities. The numbers of satellites are proliferating. There are applications for tens of thousands of satellites now. So one of the big industry issues, really, is orbital debris, generally. And so, you know, how I, OneWeb, I think, has tried to be a leader in responsible stewardship and yeah. in orbital debris issues. The SEC has a proceeding right now. Um, so let's talk about a couple of things about that. First, there's a bit of a turf war, right? The NASA has a certain view. Commerce has a certain view. FCC has a certain view. Um, how, how does OneWeb 
um, deal with those potentially conflicting views of the different government agencies? And do you think there's, you know, the FCC is taking the lead here. Is that okay? Or do you think that somebody else should be taking the lead? Um, so first of all, most of these agencies, when they put out guidelines or regulations, um, that's what a lawyer would consider a floor. That's the minimum of good behavior. It doesn't stop you from being even more responsible. And one web would like to think that we're even more responsible. So we're comfortable with everything that's being proposed. Um, one uh, of the tenets of our philosophy is we tested the heck out of those satellites before we sent them into outer space. As you said, they are expensive. And if something is wrong, you can't just go up and fix it, right? So we tested those satellites on the ground so that what we launched was not in any way expected to be debris and so far is not, correct? And they are designed um, with a way to be lowered into the atmosphere when their useful life is, is over um, and they are expected to, to burn up carefully in the atmosphere. We even designed them with a grappling fixture. It's not a hook, it's a magnetic plate. Even though the debris removal industry isn't quite ready to go up and retrieve them, but those satellites, should they for whatever reason not be deorbited and they're still going to be there, that debris removal industry is coming along and they'll be able to retrieve the satellite. So we are, we have a whole website called responsiblespace.com. Um, this is, uh, it might be responsible.space, my PR, <laughs> I'm not, they're going to be so unhappy with me. Um, we're super on top of this. Um, and uh, we're disappointed by the behavior of some other companies um, that seem to be um, launching trial balloons into the air and see what works, and then launch more of what works and worry less about what didn't work. Um, it's a very different philosophy. Um, no accidents have happened so far, Brian, right? We all know this. Um, and, and yet, I worry that it's coming. As you said, more is being launched, and, and especially not – not the LEOs, not these sort of, you know, space-based internet constellations, but the hundreds if not thousands of truly small satellites that are being launched much lower um, by every university in the world, which is incredibly exciting um, and yet also incredibly worrisome. Um, most of these objects don't have a way to get out of the way uh, of, say, an Ariane launch vehicle uh, or another object. And then there's going to be more debris. Then there's going to be an accident. Um, and, and the world's um, legal and financial and insurance uh, regimes will, will struggle to, to keep up with it all. Right. And I think one issue that, um, you know, probably everybody can just sort of intuitively grasp is um, one of the issues that's come up in the FCC proceeding is maneuverability. But right? if you yeah. launch a satellite into space and it's, at or above the space station where we have humans up there right now, um, right. you know, should it have a mandate, legally speaking, to have the capability to maneuver, in other words, to have thrusters that can redirect the trajectory because yeah. all these things are traveling at 17,000 miles an hour or thereabouts. So, you know, yeah. I think, does one have a position on that? Well, we are a hard line, yes. If you are above 400, we actually say you need propulsion, not just maneuverability. And the only reason we're specific about the technology is at this moment in time. That's the only technology that we all know works. However, I think engineers are incredible. I think they will come up with other forms of maneuverability. Um, and I'm happy for the FCC to allow that as well. Um, mm -hmm. But it's unfortunate that it's been um, uh, the range, especially between four and 600, has been very popular with a lot of the small satellites. It's been affordable. There's been a way to hitch a ride on some vehicles and just kind of get pushed off the back of the lorry as it goes down the highway, right? Um, and, and that's exciting, but we all know what it's like when, when garbage falls off the back of the truck in front of you on the highway, right? I mean, it, it, it is a direct analogy. I don't want that garbage pushed off the back of the truck on the highway. So no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, but as we learn more about space, I'm afraid that if you are above 400, you should have propulsion. And, and, and the free ride to that zone um, has to stop. It's too dangerous. Right. So there are many aspects to um, a satellite business. One of them is access to space. So you're going to manufacture satellites. You have to get them to space. Um, you have to have the 
the, um, the physical ability to occupy a certain area up there. The other area that is so important and critical is radio frequency spectrum. Right? You can't provide service without radio frequency spectrum. Um, we've seen a lot of challenges over the past few years on the spectrum front. First, we had the KA band and the UMFUS acronym. It's a real mouthful, but anyway, it's an introduct. It's a terrestrial service that's been introduced in the, into the KA band, which is making it harder for the yeah. satellite industry to access the KA band. Now we're in the midst of um, the C band, which has just been really reallocated. There'll be an auction December 8th to terrestrial wireless folks. And uh, there have even been some rumblings more recently about the KU band. So this is, a, a, you know, how does OneWeb secure its access to this vital component to its, to its network? Yeah, so, I mean, as you well know, um, spectrum is finite. New spectrum is not really discovered. Um, there's, there's, a, there's the existing pie. Um, and back to the engineers, the engineers are amazing. And as the years go on, they do find ways to more efficiently use the spectrum we know about and to push the um, into higher and higher frequencies, which, which you know, have some problems um, in physics that the lower frequencies don't. Um, so when a new technology, first 4G and now 5G, um, comes along, or a low Earth orbit as opposed to a geostationary orbit satellite, um, there is a, a, a moment when the industry looks around and says, well, what spectrum? Is that going to use? What are the, those high altitude platforms balloons? What, what spectrum are they going to use? Um, and so it's a fairly constant, uh, discussion with the incumbents, um, defending their use, um, and the newcomers, um, pushing, 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 saying, we've got to go somewhere. We have a great idea. You need to let us, uh, trial our, our technology because in fact, regulators, you may find that our technology is better for your people, right? So it's a constant, a constant struggle. Um, everybody on the call, I'm sure, remembers when the United States moved television channels, right, from analog to digital. And that was because up at the digital range, they compressed the amount of spectrum used, and the huge block down at the analog range was reallocated to, I think it was two and 3G cell phones, right? Yeah. Um, and that push only came along because Cellular mobile radio came along. Um, if we hadn't sort of invented that, there wouldn't have been a push. And the incumbents were paid to move, right? And so now that's what's happening at the C-band as well, right? There were satellites using the C-band. Um, the mobile phone industry, I believe, wants to use it for their 4G. Um, and, and so the incumbent satellite operators are being paid to move. Right now, in most of the world, there are only two other bands being used for traditional satellite applications, and those are the KU and the KA. Um, there are some other satellite applications that use L-band or S-band, but that's um, a far a smaller use. So the KA band was another example of the United States going its own way. It was, um, it was a real embarrassment, I feel. Um, the United States mismanaged that. Um, but what they did was they said, well, we'll just, we'll let, we'll take some of this away. Um, and, 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 and the rest of the world, even at the ITU said, no, no, no. The KA band, that's where the satellite, that's the meat of the brand new satellite systems. You, you shouldn't cannibalize that. Um, and they did it anyway because they had sort of an embarrassment left over from years ago where they thought a uh, terrestrial service was going to come, uh, into being and it really didn't. And then they said, Oh, well, we can, we can use that same spectrum for 5G. Look, it's a win-win. Except, of course, it wasn't. And, and now they're thinking of doing the same thing at KU band, um, which is where our user terminals are. Um, and not just ours, but, but SpaceX. And most of the existing satellite services you can think of in the United States, those small terminals are using your KU band, whether it's satellite television or, uh, point of service, what have you. Um, and, and I like to say, you know, we need it, just like we all need uh, nine pints of blood. And, and no, you, you, you can't take away three pints and give it to somebody else because that's going to kill me. Okay? So, and, the, and the problem with satellites, of course, is it takes, it takes a long time to build them and get them into outer space, and then they're there for years and years and years. Even our small ones, they're, they're designed to be there for like five to ten years. Right? It's not like we can swap it out if you take the spectrum away. 
if you're going to take spectrum away, we're talking about something that's going to be 15 or 20 years in the future. You've got to give us time to invent ways to use whatever is higher than KA, Q, V band, E band, right? We're talking about it. We're thinking about it already, but it's not quite there yet. The engineering is not quite there yet. You cannot take this away um, for quite some time. Right. So I think another angle to that is that, look, there's a big financial difference, right? Like, in other words, the Verizons and AT&Ts and T-Mobile, they're going to participate in this auction in December. It's going to raise billions of dollars for the U.S. Treasury. And the Orbit Act in the United States prohibits the auction of spectrum that can be used for global services like this. So you can have an auction for spectrum for DBS or for, for satellite radio because it's domestic only. Um, but I'm imagining that it would be a catastrophe um, for OneWeb to have to participate in an auction around the world for spectrum rights. In other words, there's no sense that one should undo um, the Orbit Act prohibition, right? Because it would be a, a flood of impossible auctions around the world, I would imagine. It would, it would completely shut down the satellite as a technology to be used in more than one country, right? Because you can't, you can't buy those rights at, at 200 countries. Yeah. It's li literally prohibitive, which is why traditionally satellite spectrum is not auctioned. doesn't mean we don't pay a fee when we have an application. We pay plenty of, you know, renewal fees and annual fees and fees for earth stations. Um, the, the government is getting money. It just isn't getting auctioned spectrum money. Right. Another question from the audience, is there a military angle to the OneWeb network? Uh, no more so than any other commercial system is, is occasionally used by militaries around the world um, as they realize that they don't have to, you know, invent and design their own satellites. They can use uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, technology for all kinds of things. So. Okay. It'll be something that you focus on. It, it, it includes service to the Department of Defense, I'm sure. Absolutely, or the UK's Ministry of Defense, right, the MOD? Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, so one other aspect of sort of a level playing field for the industry around the world, again, dealing with market access, because OneWeb is providing service in the United States through a market access. They didn't get a license per se. You started in the UK, and then you decided to enter the U.S. market. And then now there are proposals um, – put forth by a lot of U.S.-based companies that uh, applicants like OneWeb should pay fees, regulatory fees, application fees, and other things like that. So they're basically treated just like a U.S. Um, company. Can you speak to that and how that, uh, you know, what your OneWeb's view is on that and how it would impact the business if these proposals were adopted? Absolutely analogous to auctions. Um, you know, you're, you, you talk about the not having a license per se. That's a fine legal distinction, right? So, so when, when a company, uh, a satellite company decides it wants to put up a satellite, it goes to one government, right? And it says to that government, in our case, the UK, um, we'd like to use the KU and the KA band at 1,200 kilometers. And then that country goes to the ITU and files the paperwork, it's called a satellite filing, and says, okay, we have an operator that's interested in those frequencies at that orbit. Um, and and we may or may not pay um, our home government a fairly steep fee for that service. The ITU certainly charges a fee for its services. Um, and, then, and then you ask all the other countries in the world for market access. You don't need another license to be uh, a satellite operator in, in the sky. Um, and, and every country has some kind of fee for that market access, um, for the services, for say, right? There's, there's, there's no question that there's always there's always a price, right? There, there, there ain't no free. Um, but if it is as steep a fee as the original license application is, it's like the auction. You can't do that in, in 200 countries. So if you're a satellite that's only covering one or maybe two countries, right? 30 years ago, a geostationary satellite would cover maybe the, 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 the you know, the lower 48 and bits of Canada. Those so two countries at most, right? And, and not even all of them. Um, it's a very different situation. My constellation, Amazon, SpaceX, um, the Chinese, the Russians, all the people thinking of these low Earth orbit constellations are looking to cover every country in the world. Prohibitive. Cannot be as expensive in every country. You have to, you have to be, um, um, you have to understand how your own country will benefit from 
other than just a fee? Right. So I think in the United States, just for our audience, the, the annual regulatory fees, application fees are one thing, and, and constantly you know, to apply for a license for uh, an NGSO system is hundreds of thousands of dollars. These are not, you know, $10 fees or $30 fees or even $5,000 fees. It's, you know, the annual regulatory fees for a geostation at Earth Orbit Satellite in the United States are, are also over $100,000. It's a lot of money. Multiply that by, you know, hundreds of countries around the world. These are not small numbers. And in the end, the public would suffer, I suppose, right, if, if companies like OneWeb can't roll out their business because the regulatory fees are so high. Right? And, and there are definitely discussions about not offering coverage in countries where the fees are uh, um, unconscionable. And, right. and, and the discussions are, are had with those countries about the trade-off between lower fee but higher connectivity, right, which leads to higher GDP and education levels and right. what have you. We have one more question from the audience, and I think I can and respond quickly to this, and then we're going to get to our final topic. Um, the, Eugene Robin asks, going back to the regulatory question, is the U.S. positioned to split the baby now canon, or is it possible to get the access priority rules back in line with the ITU? So the, the United States has, you know, the FCC has issued its decision to, um, you know, to split the baby, basically. Um, one web actually filed a petition for reconsideration of that decision some time ago, and it's still pending at the FCC. So it's possible the commission could take this up at the moment. We're not aware of that, but the rules um, have been set by the FCC, and, and in a sense, they've been in place for a while. So, um, but it is still somewhat of an open question. Um, but um, moving back to um, the next question, and actually it's, it's the one that somebody has just chatted about, which is the change of administration, right? We have a big change coming up. Uh, Mike Pence was a huge fan of space. We just, he loves space, right? Scott Pace and all those folks that, that we all know so well, um, that the White House is very committed to it, the Space Force, a lot of different initiatives coming out of this administration, which is soon going to be leaving. Um, yeah. what, what about the next administration, and how do you foresee any changes coming about in the next year and then thereafter during the Biden administration? Um, I think, um, Brian, are you still there? Tori, Aaron, am I still there? Mm -hmm. You Sorry, are. I'm here. I just I had the um, <laughs> okay. I had the obligatory leaf blower just start outside my window. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. I was going to say that um, almost um, irrespective of how this administration feels about space, I guarantee um, at, uh, by this administration, assuming Biden comes in, um, I guarantee um, that that party um, believes in connectivity, especially the most disconnected, uh, right? So um, they won't care what technology is used uh, if they can connect everybody and make sure that every child in this country um, has uh, internet, has an education, has access to, uh, to learning, to health, um, eventually to a job. Um, oh, they will be supportive of that. So I'm not at all worried about whether um, um, they come in with a different attitude, say, to uh, the Space Force or the or the Office of Space Commerce. Um, that's separate from from our from OneWeb's mission, which I think is embraced by everybody. Right, and I will also say, as we see these services roll out, SpaceX and OneWeb, you know, SpaceX has got over 900 satellites in the year. Um, one will soon have over 100 and is going to resume its launch cadence. Once the services start rolling out, I think it's going to be a very different story. I think the current FCC has been somewhat skeptical about the ability of those large constellations yes. to deliver. Yes. When yes. we see those services start rolling out in yes. places where Verizon and T-Mobile and AT&T are not terribly likely to go, I yes. think it's going to be the end of the story. And we'll, yes. the FCC will be convinced that um, you know we need things like the spectrum access that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Listen, it's time to turn it back to, to Sally. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Ruth. It's been totally awesome to hear your <laughs> views on this, and I really appreciate it. So back to you, Sally. My pleasure. Sally, I think you're on mute. There you go. I was double-muted. My apologies. 
I was just thanking you both so very much. That was wonderful. I really enjoyed that fireside chat and uh, certainly very interesting to hear your comments on uh, where OneWeb is headed. Um, I liked the fact that we ended on a discussion with regard to education, which of course is our, our, our very important charter for WSBR. And I do believe that with connectivity around the world, we will help to uh, include more young budding engineers into the aerospace business. So uh, just as a reminder, mark your calendars for our next event, uh, December 16th. Uh, we will have uh, General William LaCourie, who will be speaking on the one-year anniversary of the Space Force on the achievements and future challenges. So once again, thank you, Ruth, so much, and thank you, Brian. And thank you for all the attendees for the support of WSCR. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.